Hi, my name is Ludovica Griffanti, and in this video I will talk about the segmentation of white matter hyperintensities or white matter lesions with the FSL tool Bianca. Although Bianca can potentially be applied to different types of brain lesions, it was originally developed to segment white matter hyperintensities. These are areas in the brain that appear hyperintense, so bright, on T2 weighted and flare images. And they are thought to be caused by a disruption of the microvasculature of the white matter. And in fact, they are called white matter hyperintensities of presumed vascular origin. They are very common in the aging brain and they are often considered benign, but they have also been associated with an increased risk of stroke and of developing dementia. So we would like to detect them, segment them and quantify them automatically. To do this, we cannot use the same approach as FAST because the number of voxels that are hyperintense are usually not enough to appear as a separate peak in the histogram and so we will need to use a different method. The tool we developed is called Bianca, which stands for Brain Intensity Abnormalities Classification Algorithm. And this is a simplified schematic view of how it works. It is a supervised classification algorithm which means that it requires a training set, some examples of what is lesion and what is not. These are usually manually labeled lesion masks of the type of lesion we want to segment. Once the model is trained with those examples, we can give Bianca a new subject, a test dataset, and Bianca will give us for each voxel the probability of that being part of a lesion. The output is a lesion probability map that can be thresholded to obtain our finally binary lesion map that we can use to calculate the lesion volume or to do voxel-wise analysis. Now let's look inside the white box and see some details about the methodology. Bianca is based on the k-nearest neighbor algorithm. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, I will explain it now with a simple example. In the image here, we have different points that represent voxels part of the training set. So for each of them, we already know if they are lesion, here in orange, or non-lesion, in blue. Now, the position of these points in the space depends on some characteristics of these voxels. We call these characteristics features, and they can be about intensity in one or more MRI modalities, they can be about spatial location or something else. I will talk later in more detail about the features that Bianca can use, but for now, since in this case we have a 2D feature space, we can describe the points with feature 1 and feature 2. So let's assume that feature 1 is the intensity of that voxel in the flare image and feature 2 is the intensity on a T1 weighted scan. Every voxel can be described in the feature space by these two features. Now, when a new voxel from a test image comes in, here in green, we can calculate these two features and put the voxel in the feature space. What the k nearest neighbor algorithm does is looking at a certain amount, k, of nearest neighbors and counts how many of them were labeled as lesions and how many were labeled as non-lesions in the training set. The ratio is the probability of that voxel being a lesion. In this example, we have k equals 9, so we look at the 9 closest points in the feature space and we see that 7 of them were labelled as lesions in the training set. So the probability that the green point is a lesion is 7 out of 9, 78%. And we repeat this for each voxel of the new image and we will end up with a probability map. So this was the core of the algorithm, but there are many options that we can play with. As I briefly mentioned, Bianca is multimodal, so we can give as input as many modalities as we want to be used as intensity features. The important thing is that they all need to be registered together in the single subject space. So we choose one modality as our base image, for example, flare, and register all the other modalities to it. The reason why we may want to use multiple modalities is because lesions might be more visible in one modality, for example, the flare, 
but other modalities might have better contrast in other areas and help removing false positives. Also, some lesion types are defined by sets of intensity rules. For example, they may need to be hyperintense in flare and hypointense in T1. So we can use as many modalities as we think could be useful for the segmentation. Another thing we can play with is the features. I mentioned before intensity features, so the intensity in each voxel, but we can also look at the intensity in the surrounding area, in an area of a certain size that we decide, and we do a local intensity average around that voxel. In this way, we can be more robust to, for example, salt and pepper noise, because isolated bright voxels will be averaged out and will not be falsely classified as lesions. And we can use these lo local averages in addition to the intensities in the single voxels. Other features that are quite useful are those describing the location of the voxel, so the MNI coordinates. They are particularly useful if the lesions that we are segmenting have a well-known pattern in the space. So, for example, white matter hyperintensities are very common around the ventricles. So having the information about whether a voxel is in that area can improve the segmentation. Something else that we can define is the composition of the training set. We have seen that Bianca works quite well with a relatively small set of minor masks, sometimes even 10 to 15, but then we can choose also if we want to use a wide range of lesions, so subjects with high and low lesional load, or to select only subject with high lesional load or low lesional load. In our initial tests, we found that training Bianca with high lesional load subjects was beneficial, possibly because it gave more examples of lesion voxels. We are now exploring the potential benefits of training Bianca with more subjects, but with a more heterogeneous lesional load. Another thing that we can choose and change is how many points to use for training Bianca. So Bianca is not going to use all the voxels of all the training images, but will take for each training image some voxels from inside the lesion mask and some voxel from outside. So we can specify whether to use the same amount of points inside and outside, in this case, the example says 2000, or to use all the voxels within the lesion masks and an equal amount outside, or we can specify the amount of the two classes separately. We found that this last option uh, was quite useful, especially when using more points from outside the lesions with respect to inside. And this is probably because the image characteristics are more homogeneous in the lesion voxels, especially the intensities, while outside the lesions we could be in the grey matter, white matter, CSF, and so the characteristics will be more heterogeneous, and Bianca probably needs more examples of that. And finally, we can choose where to select the non-lesion points. Of course, the lesion points are selected within the lesion mask, but should we use just randomly anywhere else in the brain the examples for non-lesion voxels? Should we avoid the areas just around the border of the manual masks, as the boundaries may not be well defined? Or the other way around, should we predominantly select those points since they contain information about an intensity change? So for white matter hyperintensities, we found that avoiding the borders of the manual masks was beneficial. And this is because of inter and intra rater variability in the definition of the manual masks, and also because white matter hyperintensities often do not have sharp boundaries and might be difficult to manually define an edge. However, all the options that I talked about are available in Bianca, as they could be useful for different lesions or different populations. And finally, once we obtained our lesion probability map, we can do some post-processing. If we want a binary map, we need to apply a threshold that we can decide based on our results and on how conservative we want the segmentation to be. 
We can also constrain the results of Bianca even more by applying a mask. For example, we may want to exclude the cortex, especially if we are using only flare images, because as you can see, some of the areas in the cortex appear bright on flare and might be misclassified as lesions. Other areas that may, we may want to mask out are the cerebellum and the deep gray matter structures because they are quite difficult areas where to segment lesions and Bianca is not currently optimized for that. We tested Bianca on several cohorts, including healthy aging, vascular and neurodegenerative populations. And we found that although it is not perfect to the single voxel or the single lesion count, it is pretty good in terms of overall volume and overall agreement and overlap with the manual masks. As you can see from the similarity index or DICE index calculated between Bianca results and the manual masks and from the good intra-class correlation coefficient calculated on the volumes. However, let's remember that we take the manual masks as our gold standard, but we know that they are not necessarily the ground truth. We know that there is inter and intra rater variability and often lesions themselves are very difficult to define and very ambiguous. So in terms of evaluating the performance of a segmentation algorithm for lesions, we may want to have and to use some additional metrics. And one possibility is what we did here. So correlating the total volume of the lesions with a visual rating scale. In this case, we use the age-related white matter changes score, which goes from 0 to 30, and we found a good agreement with the volumes that we calculated with Bianca. Another option is to correlate the volume with a variable that is not derived from the images, but that we know should be related to the amount of lesions. In our case, we know that age is one of the biggest risk factors for white matter hyperintensities, so we correlated the volume against age. In this specific cohort, we had a very small age range, as you can see here, but hopefully the relationship here is more convincing. In fact, Bianca is now used in the UK Biobank imaging study. You may have heard about this study. It is the biggest brain MRI dataset in the world, uh, and it includes many modalities, including flare, and it will eventually include 100,000 subjects. These are the results of the first 10,000 subjects, and we found, in addition to the correlation with age, also a strong correlation with blood pressure, which is also not surprising because white matter hyperintensities are more frequent in hypertensive people. This is instead an application on a vascular population, specifically people who experienced a minor stroke or a transient ischemic attack, and also in this case, we found a positive correlation with the visual ratings and with age and a negative correlation with cognitive performance. Again, we know that people with high lesional load are more at risk of cognitive impairment, but what we can do with the results from Bianca is not only looking at a summary measure like the total volume, but we can also do voxel-wise analysis and look at where in the brain we have an association between the presence of lesions and a group or a factor of interest. In this case, we compared two groups, people with and without cognitive impairment, and we found that people that were cognitively impaired had a higher amount of lesions in the frontal areas, specifically close to the ventricles, with respect to people with no cognitive impairment. And they also had a more global decrease of white matter integrity that we evaluated with diffusion MRI, which will be covered later on in the course. So to conclude, we saw how Bianca segments white matter hyperintensities and potentially other lesions. We went through the main options. We discussed how we can evaluate the performance on Bianca, and I've shown you a couple of research applications.